Hey, welcome to the DIY Garage, the podcast for hands-on do-it-yourself automotive enthusiasts. I'm your host, Brian Joslin, coming to you from inside the workshop studio of the Eastwood Company in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. With me today is a perhaps familiar guest, Matt Murray from Iron Trap Garage. I say familiar because for more than 10 years, Matt was the face of countless Eastwood project and how-to videos. He also produced the company blog during his time and did the social media content. He left Eastwood in 2021 to focus on his other business, Iron Trap Garage, which we'll talk about here shortly. Before we get into that, though, uh, I just want to let you know that you can catch the DIY Garage podcast on audio format on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, and most other podcast services. And if you're not already doing so, you can catch the video version of the show on Eastwood's YouTube channel. You can also go to eastwood.com slash garage and click on the podcast tab for links to the podcast in either format. Whatever your preference, we hope you'll subscribe so you never miss a new episode. With that out of the way, welcome to the podcast, Matt. Thanks. Um, so I have to ask, does it feel strange to be back in here? Uh, not so much. It's just like a, it's kind of like coming back to an old house, you, you know, you used to look like the family home, yeah. if you will. So I walk in, it just feels like, an, you know, it's kind of the same, but someone moved the furniture a little. Yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> yeah. So for more than 10 years, uh, you were essentially the face of Eastwood um, yep. in project videos, how-to videos, social media. Uh, how did you fall into that? Uh, so it was kind of a funny thing when I, I was running my, I was with a friend running kind of our, our, our own business, importing European car parts and, uh, in Volkswagens and German cars. I and think, I think we know who we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, we did that for a while and, and, um, I had been doing that full time, you know, just starting out. And I ran into a friend that I knew that worked. Knew a guy that worked at Eastwood yeah. and at a cruise in or a show. And I just like kind of jokingly said, hey, man, if you ever see that guy, let him know I'm perfect guy to hire. Like, yeah. you know, it's a stupid thing. And uh, he was like, yeah, I'll totally tell him. And he was actually the kind of dude that would follow through, yeah. which was crazy. So uh, like six or eight months later, he goes, hey, uh, my friend Nick that works at Eastwood, he said there's an opening. And I'm like, really? Are you kidding? And he goes, yeah, just here's his info. So. It just so happened Eastwood figured out that social media was a thing, yeah. and they were like, we should hire a guy. So I did the interview process, got hired, and I literally, my first day, um, I think there was 30 subscribers on YouTube and 300 <laughs> followers on Facebook, and they gave me a little digital camera and a desk and were like, do social media, yeah. do, do that thing. We don't, like, nobody really got it. There was so, no plan, just to make no, it happen. No plan, so I kind of had to figure it out on my own. I mean, it was, I was thankful that they kind of let, like trusted me to be like one day, like only a few months into working or half a year, I was like, Hey, I bought this old pickup truck and I'm just going to drop it off. Can we, it would be neat if we shot like how to like yeah. work, like project videos. And they were like, yeah, sure. Right. I guess. Yeah. And then it just went from there. So video was not something you'd done before coming here either. Or? No, I had never done any video. I mean, I had been doing social media and like for, you know, forums, of course, sure. for, huge just before that right so like i was huge on the forums every day posting updates and stuff but like i'd never done videos so i think one of my first yeah i mean i did video here and it was it was kind of it was awkward at first yeah, you know it and, always is <laughs> and i remember my the most awkward thing was literally we didn't even have a video guy yet uh, the camera guy and i went to sema and we had v8 tv was doing some contract work for us mm -hmm. so they had the v8 tv guys it was like literally landed in vegas and you're like they're like, all right, shoot an intro for for the Seamer coverage, and I was like, uh, okay, you're the guy, and and then I shot it outside of Sema, my first time there, first time in Vegas, and yeah. it was like, so it was just thrown into it, and I, you know, as the years went on, I learned how to be more comfortable and forget about the camera. Yeah, so. I, I always thought you were comfortable in front of the camera. Of course, I came in later. Yeah, the early days, it was kind of hard, and of course. With the company trying to structure, I don't do very well with reading a, a you know a, a prompt, prompt. Or, or having a script. I'm more of a like off the cuff, right. bullet points type guy. So that was the hardest part in the beginning. We were trying to like memorize a script, and I'm terrible with that. So yeah. that that was and the as, hard part. in a marketing position. There's things you have to hit. There's communication points you, you have yes. to make sure they're in yep. there. So yep. it's a tough middle ground. I know um, we worked together for about a year yep. and a half. I managed the store over yep. here for for a period in in the middle of your tenure there. And, yeah, and it was always I was more interested and being out here in the garage, which <laughs> yep. is probably how I ended up back here. But yeah. uh, it was always fascinating to watch you work and, and to work on camera, but also work on, on the vehicles. So yep. um, you left in 2021 to to focus on Iron Trap Garage, which you had kind of already started before you left? Or you yeah, 
Uh, I mean, I it all kind of, I always tell people it's a hobby blown out of control. So like, like I mentioned before I started Eastwood, I was doing buying and selling of old car parts, but they were German car parts. And then as my time went on at Eastwood, I got more interested in old hot rods and American cars more. Um, and I kind of made the switch one day. And then I started, like I had always done, buying and selling parts to fund the hobby. Sure. And then it started to grow and get more. And then, I don't know, I bought my new shop, my new property, and had a really interesting looking shop. And one of my buddies was like, you should start a YouTube channel. It, this place looks cool. So we did it. And it kind of started growing. And then when I put like my full interest in the channel, then it just, I was like focused on trying to grow it. And uh, I mean, we were literally doing, it was like two full-time jobs, you know, Mm -hmm. we were doing the channel and then I was doing the Eastwood stuff here and then it just started to grow. And then uh, I, one day I just flipped the switch, you know, and it was like, okay, let's do this. And then I think a few months after that, I hired my best friend, Mike full-time. And then a few months after that, I hired a older guy, a helper, Steve full-time and we never looked back. So it's been crazy. What's behind the name? Talk about the name. Uh, so Iron Trap Garage, the whole Iron Trap name was just literally I was looking for a, a new username on forums. Uh-huh. And I was looking up just terms or whatever. And I was thinking how this hobby, when you get really in-depth into this hobby, you're like, you're, you're in it for life. I'd meet all these older guys who are in their 80s and 90s. And I'm like, they're like talking about their next project. And they got one foot in the grave. <laughs> yeah. So like I found this term somehow. I don't even know how I found it. Just Googling or I have no idea. And Iron Trap was like a medieval torture device that once you were in it, you could never get out of it. Interesting. And I was like, that's his hobby. Like, once you're all in, even if you don't have, like, you sell all your cars, you're still thinking about cars or you're looking at yeah, cars or, yeah. you know, you're walking with your wife and you look at an old car in the street. Like, it doesn't come out of your blood. So that's where it came from. And the iron thing obviously yeah. ties in nicely. So Definitely. You got started in Volkswagens, like a, a lot of us, actually. Yeah. Um, but you're probably best known what in the rat rod scene these days i mean what's what's the genre that you kind of fell into once you moved away from the german stuff? um so yeah not definitely not rat rod um not rat rod, okay. that's that's a swear I, hope I, didn't, I hope it didn't offend you then. a little bit but it's okay, okay. That's all right. <laughs> no no that's good no just like uh we like to c- call it nostalgia hot rods and mm-hmm. customs yeah so building stuff or, uh, original like steel cars how they were built back in the day using the styling techniques and old parts. So we try and use as much original parts as we can when we're modifying cars, but we're also kind of restoring old hot rods. So it's much like you would restore a car to how it was built originally. Right. We're restoring it to how a guy would have built it in 1947. You know, so it's kind of an interesting little like corner of the hobby where we're pretty, it's pretty fun. It's like stepping back in time and driving, you know, a hot rod from the 50s. It feels like a hot rod from the 50s and you're just, maybe using tools that are new, you know, I to use a TIG welder instead of a gas welder, but right. like in the end, the overall product looks the same and yeah. feels the same. So that's, that's what we're focused in. And I found that little corner of it and our business, our parts business revolves around because we sell all those hard to find parts yeah. to recreate a hot rod. So what, what kind of parts are you into? I mean, engine parts, body parts, everything. Uh, everything? Um, we have literally a 10,000 square foot space of antique car parts so mainly early fords was kind of king with the type of cars i mean people did other types of cars but early fords um you know from model t to like 50 ish Mm -hmm. ford you know that era were kings for hot rods custom so we focus on body parts and mechanical from that but then we also stray into the you know it was cool to put an oldsmobile engine in a 32 ford a 50s olds engine so we Stray a little bit, but yeah. most of it's old Ford parts. It's so a lot of swap meet uh, kind of tours and things, uh, hunting um, down parts. Or is it mostly internet? Are, are um, you looking at stuff mostly in, in person or on, online these days when you go to source? Uh, it started out with swap meet. So when I worked at Eastwood, I, that's what I'd do on the weekend. I'd go to swap meet, look for a deal. I'd get there at dawn at a flashlight and, yeah, yeah. and find deals that I'd make a couple bucks. Well, as time went on, I started learning that if you buy in bulk, like I needed to beat everybody. So everybody else is going to the swap meet. How do I get to the stuff before it got to the swap meet? So I started learning how to get, you know, networking and stuff. And basically now with the channel, it's, we get contacted. I, I don't look anymore. And now yeah. I do buyouts. I don't, I don't buy one part. I buy everything. So if there's 10 cars and all the parts, I go in and buy everything. So you're buying up like old shops and things are going out of business or barn, barn find kind of stuff? Or barn what? finds, but collectors. I mean, you'll find with this, especially with old American cars, uh, with the old timers, 
back in the day, so to speak, the stuff was cheap and easy to find. So before the internet, you could find a farmer with a 32 Ford. He didn't really know what it was worth. He'd buy it for 25 bucks. They'd shove it in a barn. So now all that, that age group is aging out yeah. and either getting out of it or retiring or passing away. And most of them have amassed buildings. Like they don't just, you know, again, the iron trap thing, they just kept collecting and sure. hoarding. So now, and I say that affectionately, a hoarding, I'm a hoarder. <laughs> um, but they, they get all that stuff, and then at some point, they either need to sell the property to simplify their lives, or they pass away and the family's selling it. So they usually contact us. It's a turnkey thing where they can call us, and either we buy all the parts or all the cars. Or we take a big chunk. Mm -hmm. So we, I've realized that we created a solution um, for people because a lot of people, they don't want to yeah. deal with it. Or, like, it's easy to sell cars, but a family doesn't know. If you're not into this stuff, you don't know what if this part is good or this part's junk. So we go in and kind of help them with that. And uh, really, it's my selfish way of getting the best stuff. Yeah. So, like, I just skim, like, 5% off for my good, for the personal stash. Yeah, and yeah. then everything else gets sold and makes money. And cream, You, know, you get the cream of the crop because yes. you you're in the, in the yeah. market there first. Yep. So. That makes <laughs> sense. You alluded to the fact that genre is kind of aging out. How, how do you find that community receptive to you? I mean... Um, because you're you're a lot younger than yes <laughs> than most of the guys that were in that scene originally. So how'd they take to you as a young guy? Were they excited um, that you were enthusiastic about it, or are they skeptical of you? From I think a lot of it in the be when you first meet a lot of the older guys, and I started coming around swap meets and going to shows because I have tattoos and I wear a backwards hat and I I just look different. You yeah. know, I look like some punk kid, even if I'm in my forties. You know, they're like so they. They weren't mean, but they didn't take you seriously. Yeah. And then when they started seeing, like, I had the skill level to build these cars or a guy would come visit my shop. And then obviously now that I started a YouTube channel, like, we're on a platform yeah. that people see us. So now they, that's not an issue. They, yeah. they, they love that we're trying to keep the hobby going. So that's a big part of what our channel is for what I do is trying to teach some of the not so much like what Eastwood does with teaching how to weld. I'm teaching how to build the car period correct. So right. I'm saying you use this steering box. A guy would have done this. So they like that we're passing on that info to the next generation. The tradition. You're, you're yes. getting it, keeping it moving. Yep. Um, as a fairly young guy in, a, in that subculture yep. um, that goes back at least 70 years, yep. of, uh, you know, rotting culture and stuff. Um, how do you see the future of the hobby as someone with fresh eyes? I think it's discussed a lot in the antique car community. I think it's it's changing. I think most younger people are into modified cars. So if they are into a, a World War II era car or before, usually they're in, especially what I see from our business, they're building old hot rods. Yeah. They're not really restoring. Like the days of restoring a Model T to original yeah. is phasing out, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, there's still going to be some people holding on to it, but... Um, I think with some of those really old cars, they're hard to drive on modern streets mm -hmm. um, regularly other than doing a little tour. So that's where the hot rods come in because you're making it a little faster, a little, you know, more <laughs> able. I still, these cars still can't keep up with a, you know, a brand new highways, so to speak. Uh, but yeah, I think you're seeing more of the guys and gals grabbing onto modified cars. Now, right. I think it's different when you get into 50s and 60s cars because those cars they can change some tires and do a little thing they can keep up but yeah. with the um pre-war type cars yeah i think you're seeing a lot more of the hot rod stuff but it's it's changing but there's it's the people that are into it are really into it so it's not like i think there's not as many people mm -hmm. uh, you know as a percentage but i think the people that are into it are like really really into it they're not just casually into it they're you know it, yeah. their life revolves around it are you seeing new ideas or are people kind of building what they've seen in magazines for years, you know, trying to replicate what they've, what others have done before them? Like, is there, is there any new ground to be gained in such an established community like that? Um, I always joke that nothing, with hot rods and customs, nothing's new. Everything's yeah. been done, whether it's been done crude before, somebody's kind of done it. Yeah. But I think you're seeing with some of the higher end shops and having the technology of 3D scanning and 3D printing and, um, even like CNC mills and stuff, you're getting people are able to create things that are a higher quality, much easier. So you're, yeah. I think the bar has been raised on the quality of builds for sure. Um, there is some little things here and there, but like in the end of the day, it's all kind of been done. It's just a guy might have did it a different way instead of building it out of one piece of billet, a guy would have cobbled it together out of some round bar stock or whatever. Yeah. So I, I, 
I think it's just, uh, it's again, they're, they're doing modifications that are new to keep up with modern highways and driving is a lot of the stuff I'm seeing, which yeah. is super cool. Because people want to use the cars. They don't yes. want to build them and then just sit in the garage. You want to take them out and show them off, share them. Yeah, and that's you, the goal. You have to get somewhere. <laughs> yeah, and, and some people are really into the long distance thing. They want to drive their car from here to California. So like I can, you know, with the period of cars, you can drive them that far, but it's a lot harder. So you do some small changes that are maybe nostalgic looking, mm -hmm. put a modern rear, but make it look nostalgic. Then you can do 90 and you can drive it on the highway. And so all that stuff I think is good. It's just, what do you want to do with the car? So yeah. Aesthetically, is there anything that's like too far for the, for that crowd, like LED lights and things like that? Or is it, is it uh, risk of going too modern? I think that's the difference between a street rod and a and a, and what we call a real hot rod or custom. The, I like to use the nostalgia. A lot of people say traditional, yeah. Um, but I like to use nostalgia. That that's I think that's the difference between a street rod and a nostalgic hot rod is you're trying to keep it looking like it would have looked in the 40s, 50s. So when you start putting LED lights and you know bucket seats that are from a minivan, and again that's all for comfort. I understand it, but that's where the street rod and yeah. hot rod break is and it's totally cool, whatever you want. But for looks wise, I like that. I want it to look like it was, you know, a guy after World War II was driving it. Yeah. So I offended you with rat rod. Talk about rat rods a bit. <laughs> it wasn't a, it's a joke amongst my friends yeah, because no, like, I, every, generally the community, uh, the car community as a whole doesn't even fully understand. They think anything that's a hot rod has now become a, like hot rod and rat rod have become the same word. Okay. Um, to me, a rat rod is more trying to make something that's, shocking whether it's crappy or whatever it is yeah. super low chopped so far that looks like a more of a cartoon yeah. um and putting diesels and big wheels or mud tires it's just again that shock value that is much different than what a nostalgic like a nostalgic hot rod is and custom is it looks right it just it just does so but uh i think that's what the rat rod thing I i'm okay with it it's a different subgenre of all of this but yeah. like you're definitely trying to make a shock value when you roll in with saw blades on the visor. And, and I think it's like anything. The hobby guys get so into it that it kind of gets gaudy when you're putting rubber rats on the – gluing them to the hood of the car. Like yeah. it, it kind of becomes a cosplay rather than a car. So yeah. that's – I know people probably don't like that. But so the rat rot thing, it's a little frustrating sometimes because anybody thinks anything that's not shiny is a rat rod where I – I always say that like the cars we have are survivors. Like we try and bring the old paint back and it's much like an old piece of furniture or a piece of artwork. You're trying to like, trying to keep it as nice as you can for the age it is without yeah. restoring it because it sh with reproduction bodies now, yeah. it's kind of like a badge of honor to have a car with old paint because it's not a, re you can't, f you can't fake real old paint. Right. You know? so. so is patina a little uh, played out at, at this point, do you think in the uh, scene or is it? I don't know. I think it's, again, like everything, if you're fake patina, doing fake patina on a car that shouldn't have it, like, right. I'm all for having on a, a car. On a steel body or something. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I, or fiberglass car. Fiberglass, it's, it seems yeah. kind of odd. Rusty but, fiberglass is always yeah, odd. Yeah, just like, just buy an old crappy car. So I, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, it's like every trend, guys. Somebody wants a patina car, but they don't want the work of actually trying to bring old paint back or yeah. do rust repair. So I get it, but you can tell a patina car from a, a real original paint car that's just worn through from a guy polishing yeah. it all these years so that's again that's my preference i like the real deal don't fake the funk you know yeah, it's like yeah. that's just how i am about it let's talk a little bit about the projects that you built partly while you were here but also yeah. what you build now um are you self-taught in, ter in terms of fabrication or did you grow up doing any of that i mean how did that all come about or did you learn it on the set here at uh, eastwood like a lot of us are doing every day <laughs> Well, I was fortunate enough that um, my father was a mechanic and could weld, and he did heavy m equipment welding. So when I was a kid, he just showed me how to make sparks with a MIG welder, and you know, so I was self-taught 100%. Other than my father teaching you didn't me go to that. tech school or anything nope, like you didn't. No, nope. okay. I went to high school, graduated high school, and just been that was it. So I just figured it out. So my father showed me how to turn the welder on, the concept. But my father was a heavy equipment welder. He was never make it yeah. nice or restore a car. So as the years went on, even before Eastwood, I was starting to, I had a MIG welder and was fixing cars and, and building old German cars. But then when I got to Eastwood, it, it was the, I was exposed to the higher quality work because mm -hmm. we started traveling around, going to California, 
seeing some of the hot rod shops you're touring and you're seeing the quality of work these guys are doing you're like man i want to do that and yeah. and then like i was fortunate enough that when i started at eastwood we didn't even have welders and mm-hmm. then welders came out and they're like well we have a tig welder we got a you know, we got to start showing people how to TIG weld. So I literally, we, we had one guy come in and kind of show a few of us how to TIG weld. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I just literally for a year, I took my lunch break when the studio used to be in the other part of the building. And every day for my lunch break, I would go and sit down and TIG weld. Wow. For an hour a day, I would TIG weld. And for like a year, almost every day, that was my lunch. And by after like a year, I started feeling proficient that I could at least do some stuff. And then I started you know, showing on camera a little bit. And it was always awkward because I still don't feel like I'm a good TIG welder, but it was Does always... anyone ever feel like they're a good TIG welder? I mean, there are, I know there's... Not when you look at the internet. Yeah. yeah it's, 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 it's really sad when you look at the really good guys because <laughs> yeah. uh, it's terrible. So I don't... That was always a hard for, part for me because we were showing people how to TIG weld in videos. Right. But I... It was awkward because I never felt like I was to the quality. And I even to this day, I don't feel like I'm... You know, that's, I think that's a lot of us when you're welding or fabricating. Yeah. You never feel like you're good enough to be teaching other people. Right. When are you good enough? When you're like 80 and you're, <laughs> you know, you're, you're at the peak of your, I don't know. So. Yeah. I think, I think we all run into that challenge, you know, producing content for, you know, for Eastwood yep. because we don't, we all come out of different elements of the hobby and, and in some cases the business, but, you know, we're not plucking people off of, you know, iron workers off of bridges to, to come in and teach people how to weld. Yes. Um, but I think it, it speaks to the kind of DIY uh, mentality around yes. here. And so we're learning on the fly. We're building the plane as, as it's taken off and all that. Yep. And, um, but I think we all learn in the process as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. How much did you learn in your time here at Eastwood? How many new skills did you learn out of necessity? A ton. I mean, a lot of my – the fabricating stuff 100%. Like metal the actual like, metal like, shaping. Yeah. Um, now, again, I was fortunate – with Eastwood and my position, I was able to meet and and take some classes with you know Winfield. I hung out with Winfield a right. ton and um, got to be friendly with him. And Covell came and did some classes. So it was like I was able to kind of really get jump started because we were doing all, and I was soaking up every bit of knowledge I could get. I was going to local friends that had higher end metal shaping shops after work at Eastwood. I would go there at night and help them for till midnight and then come back into work next day because I was so focused on trying to quickly get my skills up yeah. and uh, but yeah I mean being able to do it almost every day was you know that really helps it was kind of a nice thing you had to pay to play <laughs> so to speak and learn sure um, it was just you know I was learning uh, myself there wasn't you know you didn't have Winfield next to you or, or Covell here every day so you'd learn a little bit in a class and then you're Practice trying to it. figure it out here yeah. and show it on camera and you know, so it, but it was, it was, yeah, I learned a lot of my skills here at Eastwood, you know, on the fly, which was, was great, fortunate. Out of all those guys you got to work with, uh, who probably inspired you the most? Definitely Winfield. Winfield. I mean, he, um, he is, he's the dream. I mean, yeah. uh, like he's, he's almost a hundred years old, you know, he's done it all. He's seen it all. He's, he's literally lived in, in most hot rodders eyes like the dream life because he's kind of run his own shop and lived life on his own terms and some you know paid the bills may not be a rich man at his age currently but like the experiences and everything he's done and been on his terms is you know so not only like fundamentally for my life how i live my life he was impactful but also like seeing his work and it like you meet your you you meet somebody and you hold it on a certain standard i'm not saying that winfield's work was terrible but like it made me like okay the work that i see on the internet and then you see a legend yeah you're like okay he was building beautiful cars but it's okay to put body filler it's yeah you know he was doing that and he didn't care he was fine with like he's like this is what i did it's this is how i build cars and it's totally fine and if you don't like it you don't like it but this is how i build them and they're his thing was like they're they're bitching in the end yeah and he's you're like oh all right you're right like who cares if it's painted and nice or it, it looks cool it doesn't matter. I mean, he was building show cars. I mean, that's yes. that's what he did. And I think most people probably know George Barris mm-hmm. more commonly, but... Uh, yeah, Bar- Barris was better at promoting himself. Right. Um, and his brother Sam was doing some beautiful customs. George and Sam were doing beautiful customs before Sam passed away. And those are the cars I gravitate more towards, where George kind of went in the TV cars and, and show cars. He was great at marketing himself. He's a great photographer. So like yeah. George did so much 
So he had a PR, a built-in PR yes. machine around him. Yeah, it. he knew what he was doing, yeah. But Winfield was right there with him building the yeah. same kind of cars in the same scene at the same time. And Yeah, that it, was it. I think Winfield just, I mean, he was getting almost as much promotion, I mean, traveling around and doing all that stuff in the, in the height of all of that. But, yeah, I mean, he from racing at Bonneville and racing at, at the Dry Lakes, to building customs. I mean, literally from he was a young man all the way through. So like, it was super cool to see that and, and learn about that stuff. And that inspired me uh, a million percent, you know, the, the time I spent with him. So Yeah. Is he still inspiring young, young guys? I mean, I know we had him in, in, in the shop here for, uh, several times over yep. the years. And um, it seemed to be an older crowd that grew up reading him and, you know, magazine coverage and things like that. Is, is there anyone that, that's coming after him? The guy's 100 years old at this point. Like, he's clearly not going to be with us forever, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or he may be. I don't know. I mean, it's I hard to know, know how, a gene. I know he told me his mother lived to, like, 103 or something like that. Yeah. And, like, a bunch of people in his family. So somehow they got great genes, and a bunch <laughs> of their people or family are living long. But, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people in the community that are coming up that are, I think— you know, following, but nobody can follow. Those are the OGs. Yeah. None of us could ever hope to be to that level. Those guys are original badasses. They they did it when there wasn't as many rules and the world was kind of wild. And yeah. so like even today, like we're trying to replicate it, but like we'll never get to that. But there's definitely a lot of people that are con- like we talk about continuing the tradition, so to speak. So I, I'm with social media, it allows a lot more people to kind of be on blast that you get publicity, but. Um, I think I think we're in good hands. I think yeah. there's a lot of people. Are you seeing much in the way of uh, new trends uh, with young guys that that the old guys never did? I mean, beyond uh, beyond like the 3D printing and things like that, which is obvious. But like any any new metal shaping or uh, you know wild skills that are coming out of uh, current generation stuff. I think it's just the quality of work is quality. better. I think that's like we're we're smarter now. We're we're more educated on what is safe. Yeah. And what is good work and bad work? So, like back in the day, you didn't know. You didn't know any better. There was nothing, and you you just welded it and you you drove around your town, and that was it. So now, we watch all this stuff. I think everybody's skill level and quality of work has to go up. So I think yeah. you're, I think ninety nine percent of the cars are being built now by the average guy is probably something in the nineteen fifties would have been like Winfield quality work because we have more tools. Yeah, you know. Companies like Eastwood are able to produce tools that are more affordable for the average guy. So back in the day, you couldn't, when a MIG welder was very expensive sure. when it came out. Yeah. Now everybody can get a MIG welder and do the same work. So I think the quality of work as a whole, because of things are more accessible and cheaper, it just makes it better. So I wouldn't say there's anything new. Metal is metal. There's yeah. not much you can do that's that's new in that terms of that. But um I mean, there's a again. It just goes back to technology. You see yeah. a little bit of hydroforming type stuff starting to happen, but I think that's really just the quality of work. Yeah, cool. Um, any advice for someone who's uh, building their own custom project and and trying to get their feet wet? What's 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 the best advice you've got? You know, from someone who started with Volkswagens and and uh, s- starts building hot rods. You know. Well, I think uh, it's the same. I don't care what car you're building. My, the term I always use, and we say it a lot in our videos, is uh, small victories. Yeah. And that was my little thing I've always put in my head. Every day or every time you work, try and get some small thing accomplished that you, you can stand back and be like, awesome. And that's, it's, you know, it's just little bits at a time, and then the car gets done. I think that's the biggest problem a lot of people get into is you get into this project, and it's so overwhelming because the car's blown into a 1,000 pieces. What do I do next? So it's like... Okay, today I'm going to attack this fender and make it better. Forget about the rest of the car, and then you just do one piece at a time. And that, the small victories is how I always do it. A lot of times it's like you're trying to get to a point where you get some monumental thing done, whether it's you get the car to fire for the first time or you, you, know, you get that one fender and primer, and it's like, okay, and then you, I did this one. It's a lot easier to move to the next one. You get inspired rather than you get nowhere doing a little bit on everything on the car. And, you know, it's, it's, that's probably the best advice I've gotten with a person that has like 10 projects going at once. That's yeah. how I do it. <laughs> I tend to be in that mode as well. Yes. You can see yeah. behind me what, I, what I'm deep into yep. here. Yeah. So <laughs> tell me what you drove in today. It was a 41 Ford. What, uh, is, what was that? Uh, I drove a 39, 39, okay. 39 Ford, uh, deluxe, uh, coupe. Um, we found that in December. 
Survivor, right around Christmas. Survivor car? Yeah, I found that in a, I bought that and a Lincoln, 41 Lincoln Zephyr Continental, well, Continental convertible. And that from the same estate in a garage, falling down garage in Jersey. And it hadn't been driven in years, had all kinds of crazy wiring. So that was like a couple of days before Christmas. And then I've been driving it. You know, we polished out the old paint, rewired a bunch of stuff. And literally, I just passed like week or two, been driving as a daily just to work out all the bugs. Yeah. And hasn't really been on the road for real probably since like the 70s or 80s. Wow. Um, I mean, it was driven a little bit, but like definitely wasn't driven like I'm driving it where you're driving a half an hour or an hour or whatever. Yeah. So trying to work out all the bugs and make sure nothing's, you know, weird with it. So yeah. you got plans for it as a project or you're going to keep it just a driver? It's kind of good as is. I did it. It's 99% original. The car has, it's kind of crazy. It's 99% original paint. I just wet sanded and buffed it out. And then I put a better, it had like a cobbled together dual exhaust. So I put Fenton manifolds and dual exhaust, true, like better dual exhaust on it that's not falling apart. And then some suspension stuff, lowered it a little bit and kind of just left it. That's one of those cars you can't really do too much. It's at the point where a guy could totally put it back to 100% original, the next person, yeah. or you could leave it as a mild hot rod like that. But I you just showing it anywhere this year or are you going to just? I, I don't do a lot of shows per se. I just drive the cars. I don't, yeah. I mean, I do shows, but like for me, it's more like this. Like I just drive them like, Everyday cars. Wherever yeah. I'm going, I just drive an old car, and it's just... Uh, we definitely do some shows throughout the year, um, but it's tough. I mean, with this, my schedule it's these days, it's very tough to plan on going to a show. But, like, there's a show in Michigan we do at the Gilmore Museum every year now that's I like going to because it's different, like, different cars. So I mm -hmm. go to all the cruise-ins in the area, you know, just because it's right. show up, leave, do whatever you want. We go to this one in Michigan because it's totally different cars. It's at the Gilmer Museum, which is a beautiful setting. Um, and we do some shows like that that are a little more like, but I'm more into like, for me personally, it's like the smaller, more intimate, you know, a friend that has a garage like I'll have, have a private barbecue and yeah. 70 cars will show up, <laughs> but it's all private and everybody has the type of car you enjoy and yeah. people you want to hang out with rather than a, you know, the good guy shows and his real big ones. They're great. Fantastic. I just get a little overwhelmed. I'm not a, big crowd person. So yeah. I go to those, I'm kind of like over it after an hour, you know? Yeah, I hear that. Just me, introvert, you know, that's kind of sure how I am, so. It's interesting you say that about the, you know, the more intimate events. Um, the event scene itself has changed a lot in the last few years. Um, you know, we were talking earlier about uh, Race of Gentlemen mm -hmm. has, has kind of spawned to like a very aesthetic, very focused kind of uh, event feel. And there's, uh, there's so many other events. Talk, talk mm -hmm. about what else there is other than just the community car shows, which are seem to be everywhere these days. Like, yeah. You can't get away from events. Uh, Race of Gentlemen put it on a public platform. So um, there's a lot of shows before Race of Gentlemen that were doing the same idea. There, in this area in southern PA, there was the Jalopy Showdown was a show at an old shutdown dirt circle track, and you could run your car. Basically, anybody could run an old car around the circle track for fun, and there was a car show, and that was going on for years. There was... A lot of old nostalgic drag racing yeah, events. Okay. There's the EMMR museum ended up being there, and there's a racing museum, and everything spawned from there. But like that show was going on. That was one of the first shows I went to that was like a driving hangout. There was a campgrounds next to it, and like the first time I went to that show, it like blew my mind away because everybody was camping next to the show, and people were showing up days before the event to just camp and hang out yeah. and drive their cars to go do whatever. And it was like the show was kind of like the last day, and people were like. They went to it, but it was more about the, you know, driving on the track and doing all that stuff. So, but Race of Gentlemen was on a public platform. So mm -hmm. it got big sponsors, Harley Davidson and all these people sure. sponsored. So they were able to elevate it. It's super cool. I went to that, the first handful of them also changed my mind with all that because you just saw all these people and types of cars in one place that, um, influences you is like oh there's a lot more people into this stuff yeah so but i think because of that and event it, and it probably brought out people that don't normally go to car shows right yes yeah. yeah yeah a lot of stuff you see at those events there's a lot of guys like myself that we don't go to a lot of the big car shows and like they don't you know you show up to an event once in a while and people are like oh i didn't know i've never seen your car enough around here like well i don't go to the same type of lawn chair shows yeah um so you've got a lot of people that feel that way and there's this little subgenre of people going. So there's um, uh, there's a there's a guy locally that is a second generation EJ Kowalski that him and his father 
you know, been doing it forever. But EJ's another guy who was doing it before Race Gentleman got big. He was putting on these like races at all the circle tracks that they would do it like in between the big car racing. Mm-hmm. They would let the roadsters get on and they'd let you run exhibition and you paid your 20 bucks, put your helmet on, and you could run around for fun in these cars. So he's been doing it forever. And now he's been slowly getting it to the point now where nowadays, every weekend you can either go drag racing or go run a circle track with a pre-war car and just have fun, whether yeah. you're doing it for to be competitive or you just want to run around and have fun in it. So I think every part of the country now, you're seeing that where there's a little mini race a gentleman type event without maybe it's not on the beach right but it's period correct cars or nostalgic cars running and uh, and then of course with you know the the dragon drive events we've been talking we kind of mentioned off camera like those events with the high power cars right are huge these days they want like they want to drive the car and race it at the track and you're doing a road trip all in the same thing so like yeah. all that stuff is like it's about the adventure and the you know all of that that, that really, these kinds of events really keep the scene alive too, because mm-hmm. it's not a static display. You know, now, now the car's got to work. Yes, yes. <laughs> you can't just pull it off a trailer, put it in a lot, and and uh, and hope to win a trophy. You're yep. actually out using it, and uh, and it's it's got to be a runner. It's got to be reliable. Yep, yep, yeah. So the, those those events, I think, are very cool. Even if you're not racing, like yeah, um, uh, EJ has an event in Allen, here locally at the Allentown Fairgrounds. Uh, which is coming up on like the June first this year, where it's like on the straightaway of the old Reading Fairground Circle Track, and it's mm-hmm. all early like flathead powered cars, real short track, but it's a, just a fun flag drop. And, but like even if you don't want to race that, you can just show up and hang out in the pits with your old car, and you're amongst your people, and there's no awards. It's just hang yeah. out. So like even if I don't want to race, I'll drive an old car and sit in the pits and hang out with my friends, and it's like. So that's the whole idea. It's like you're still going there, and there's something more. Insane. Like you're watching people race the cars. Your buddies are racing their cars, or you're racing, or whatever. And so you can come and go as you please. Yeah. It's not like some of the big shows where you're stuck there all day. And I hear know. I hear more resistance to being stuck all day. Uh, yeah. about car shows. I'm like, terrible with that. I know I'm not getting a trophy. Don't make me, you know, don't lock me into a parking yeah. lot for five, six hours or whatever. And yeah, I don't. Especially I, as, as, you know, summers are hot and, you know, mm-hmm. depending on the venue, there may or may not be shade. You're on asphalt or whatever. So, yes, there's yeah. a, I think a lot of us are kind of tired of the you sit in traffic to get into the show right. and then you sit all day in the hot sun and then you sit in traffic to get out of the show. And it's like a whole yeah. thing. So I think a lot of people are liking these other events that are smaller less involved you don't have to pay big money to get into the like some of these big shows that are good guys type shows it's like you got to pay a lot of money just to sit in a parking lot or sit in a thing like i wanted to show up and pay five bucks and hang out and watch some friends race and if i feel like leaving in an hour and a half i can you know i can stay all day so those big shows are still viable though too right i mean they they keep the scene alive as well just um, i think people move through different phases of of you know the hobby yeah i I don't want to you know, say that those shows aren't cool. It's just not for everybody. But like those shows are where the best cars are. So if you want to go see quality high-end cars, all the big builders are taking their cars to those shows to compete for the yeah. So like it's fun to go to those shows as a spectator and look at the high-end cars. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a huge following for that. I just, you're now seeing, it's nice because you're seeing there's more options. So yeah. bef- where before you had to go to street ride, na- like for the old cars, had to go to a street ride nationals because that's all there was. And even though, you know, not all the types of cars you want to see are there, you have to go and there's 3,000 cars and you're there all week. But now you can be like, you know what, instead of that, I'm going to go to this smaller event, you know, instead. So I just like that some of these driving events have created, like splintered off into small little fun events that you can yeah. do and gives you more options if, you know, every weekend you can look and be like, do I want to go to a small event, a big event? a picnic or whatever and it's it's a lot of fun so there are so many events right now i mean i know we're in an area that's rich with yes. car culture too i mean yep. so maybe not everywhere in the country is, is slammed with events but um man locally there's just so much going on every weekend and you know we're just my wife and i were discussing you know the next couple of weeks i'm like I, I don't know there's so many things i want to be at and mother's day is coming up and yeah, yeah <laughs> it's yeah. like um she wants to go elsewhere and i'm like that's fine i got like three shows i can go to if you want to <laughs> yeah, go, do go to the, go to the yep. beach for you know with friends or whatever so it's uh yeah there's so much so much I, happening i think i end up I, I know a lot of people on the east coast with the weather or anywhere in the country where the weather is poor over the winter yeah you get the spring and you like i always overdo it because yeah. it's like i'm so psyched to drive new cars 
go and see friends. So I like do every weekend doing events. Yeah. And then by the time it gets to like July, I'm like so burnt out. I'm like, man, I just want to stay home this weekend. Cause like every weekend you're going like here or there, yeah. or, you know, whatever. And you feel like you got to be preparing all week to go to this event or whatever. So like I know April and May and June, it's like craziness. And then I kind of like, okay, I need to take July off. And yeah. Then August around here, August is crazy. And then we get into Carlisle and Hershey and all that madness for the fall. So it's like you get very little window for breathing in the warm weather. <laughs> yeah, I felt for like the last three years, and partly being in the business, I understand, mm -hmm. you know, the we're, we're trapped in it, so to speak. Yes, yes. But uh, I feel like I get to April and realize my whole summer is already set. Like mm -hmm. I'm weaving between obstacles that are already yep. already set. So <laughs> Yeah, all the shows that you And I don't like have anything to show. It's just things that I go to, you yeah. know, I, so... Yeah, that's that's usually how it is. Usually, all the car shows, uh, you know, the big car shows, their dates have been picked ahead of time, and yeah. you kind of put in your calendar. And it's like, oh man, am I gonna, you know, a birthday party I gotta go to? But I wanted to go to the show, and it's like crap, you yeah, know, like every exactly. weekend there's a conflict. Well, hey man, I really appreciate you coming by, of uh, you know, for the new podcast, and and uh, we're anxious to get this going. Glad yeah. that you could be part of it, and uh, you know, good to have you back in the building. We're gonna go check out your car before we uh, yeah, of course, before we wind down. And for anyone who's uh, listening to this instead of watching it, uh, you'll have to check out the website for yeah. uh, for pictures of what Matt drove in. It's pretty cool today. So awesome! Thanks uh, for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate it. it. It's great to have you back. So. Awesome! Thanks. Thanks, guys. Yep.